All right, welcome everyone. It's Chris Petrie. Thanks for coming by. And it's an extreme beginners video tutorial. We're actually I'm going to create a beautiful landscape scene here. So we're going to have a wonderful time doing the glazing technique. We're going to show you every detail, every step of the way. Oodles of information here. We're going to give you all the sharp details and all of the factoids that you need in this video to get you to the place where you can create this painting effortlessly in watercolor. Okay, so let's get started in just a second. I just want to mention that it's a landscape scene. We're going to cover the glazing technique again. All of the light watercolor washes over the painting to start with. Let that dry, and then you're going over with your darker uh, subsequent washes over top, your darker tonal values, which are the mountains, the trees, and the uh, foreground here. So uh, let's have a fun time together. Let's get started, and uh, we'll uh, get going in just a second. All right, we just saw the finished painting. Again, thank you so much for uh, joining along on this tutorial. We're doing a beautiful landscape scene with the glazing technique. The glazing technique is so much fun. And uh, so we're going to get started here in just a second. I just want to say thank you so much. If you've been with me for quite a long time, I know many of you have been with me many years and you're watching all my videos, not just extreme beginner videos, but also the uh, intermediate and uh, expert style videos. But all the videos are fine for everyone. So even if it's if it's not an extreme beginner video and you're an extreme beginner and just starting out, please watch the other videos that I create too. Everyone can benefit from all of the videos that I make, but I do, again, create these extreme beginners for people that are just starting out because I cover more of the basics of uh, how to get started with watercolors, but I do put in a lot of interesting information <laughs> as we go. So always remember, no matter what... Uh, you know, whether you're just starting out, whether you've been painting a couple years in watercolor, or, you know, two, three, four, five years, or maybe even if you're an old grizzle pro and you've been doing it for 10, 15 years, you might still learn a few things because I'm always reading books and, and uh, you, know, artic you know, articles and magazines, watercolor magazines, and I'm always looking at books and watching, buying new videos, watercolor videos from all the great artists that are out there today, all the newer um, uh professional watercolor artists that are out there creating uh, books and DVDs and things. So trust me, I'm always going to try to give you the most that I can, the whole enchilada, if possible, everything, the, you know, the, the sharp detail, the factoids, everything that I can so that you get better at your watercolors. And I, I know many, I know all of you have, are getting better with your watercolors and doing absolutely much better uh, each week and each month and year after year as you uh, come along here with me on this channel, on our channel, and uh, create paintings. So let's get started. Um, and again, if you're brand new here, thank you for coming by. And again, if you've been here with, you know, with me for many years, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And many of you that have been here for years, oh my gosh, you send me so many great uh, comments in the comments section and, you know, really give me a lot of encouragement. And that really keeps me juiced to keep going and keep painting on YouTube. So um, as long as you're here uh, with me, I'm going to keep going. Okay. All right. So let's get started now uh, on the real, uh, you know, basic uh, nuts and bolts of this here. Uh, of the landscape. I'm just going to basically, I already have some hash marks on my paper just so I can kind of know what I'm going to do beforehand. So I don't have to sit here and, you know, cover everything that I'm doing in, you know, uh, you know, my new detail. Let's just say I've put some lines on where I want the hills and grass and some of the trees. And that's about it. And the rest is just real fun glazing technique. We're using the glazing technique here. First wash, really, really light, beautiful light wash first. Let it dry 100% of the way. Come back after it's 100% dry. And then you do your medium and darker tonal values over top. So that's what we're going to do. That's the basics of it, okay? So let me get my um, started and get my, my uh, landscape going here. So I'm going to just, uh, what I'm doing here is getting that first kind of area where there's a field in the very, very foreground here. So very, very foremost in the front here, the foreground, I'm gonna have a little field with some golds and greens. So I'm just gonna have some fun with the colors, golds and greens. Lots of golds and greens in this painting with some blues too as well, and some purple. And then uh, as we get that first foreground area, then we wanna start building depth in our paintings. So now we're gonna go with another um, bit of, um, hills. So we want to do some hills over here 
like so. Like that. Some hills with some trees and bushes. And then over here, we're going to want to start making a distant hill, quite a bit of a, a good prominent hill, kind of like a mountain, a small mountain top here in the center of the picture, pretty much right here. So this is like kind of the top of the mountain area. And then even more to get it more exciting and more depth in our painting, we're going to add those purple mountains in the background. So you'll see some purple mountains over here. And then another purple mountain over here, distant mountain, like that. And that's how we, we've built this watercolor here, the landscape for the most part. Up here is our sky, and then we can do some beautiful sky washes, maybe with just some lights and darks, but we're not going to get too um, fancy with clouds and things. I don't really like to make really fancy and uh, detailed sky uh, washes. I like the sky washes to be real simple. Um, they tend to come out really good that way. And I've practiced sky washes for more than 15 years now. And I can really say, I really feel like if you keep your, if you keep your sky washes simple, you're going to be much happier and they're going to look much better. Once in a while, if you want to do a really fancy sky, uh, you know, with clouds, that's fine. But for the most part, I like to try to keep them simple. Especially if you have a lot of detail in the foreground here, like we have here. Okay, so that's it. We have our pencil sketch in. So that's really the basics of it. You're going to get your pencil sketch in. I'll go a little darker with my pencil sketch, just so you can kind of see what I did. Um, so I got my first layer, let's say, or my first area of the field. Foreground, closest to us. So this is the closest area as if you were standing here in this scene, looking into this scene. And you're actually standing here, maybe you have your easel and your paints and you're going to paint this scene and you're sitting in this beautiful field with some mountains and distant hills and mountains and, and uh, beautiful uh, trees and sky, big sky. If you were sitting right here, this would be the foreground right here where you're sitting in your chair or standing, maybe taking a picture. You're going to do some uh, sketch work. You're going to do some painting, some small compositions out here by this beautiful, lovely scene. So this is, would be the field that you're going to be standing in. And then as you go further into the distance, you're going to see a little more bushes and trees. We're going to have a, a tree over here too. Let's do this tree now. Let's get this tree and let's go pretty much up above the distant mountains a little bit. So we're going to do some pine trees over here. So I forgot to mention, let's do some pine trees over here. Just some fun, happy pine trees like that. One there. Let's do another one right next to it. A little bit shorter, not as tall. So we have one pine tree kind of tall, one a little bit shorter. And we're going to do those really fun and loose and free. And we have all kinds of hills in front of them and bushes, so you don't have to get too worried about the, the tree trunks at the bottom. We're not, we're not going to worry about that too much. And then we'll have another pine tree right next to this one. And this one's smaller. And we'll just kind of add that one in too. And we're going to do most of this with all with the brush and you'll see how we do that. But I just wanted to get it in first here on our sketch. So that's what we did. We did the foreground here, field, and then here we have our hill. We have our three pine trees like this, three pine trees here, some more of those bushes and things. And we'll have a little bits of, let's do some trees. Our pine trees are kind of straight up like this. And then we'll do some kind of other smaller interesting uh, tree shapes, but they're going to be kind of, they're going to be twisted and kind of leaning a little bit like that. We'll have a couple over here, maybe a few more here. And they're, they're approximate. You don't have to be perfect with it or anything like that. A couple more like this. A couple more like that. Maybe there's a fence over here. You could have a fence in this painting. So you can make a fence with some posts. Maybe the fence posts are a little bit here and there, twisted, bent. You don't have to make them perfect. And that's all. We have some really nice verticals. So you can kind of see lots of verticals here all the way through this area. The, the um, foreground and the middle distance, we have lots of verticals. 
And then over here we got we have our mountain, our large prominent mountain that sits right here in the middle distance. And then in the far distance we have our purple mountains in the background, all the way over here. And there you can see, that's how we do our sketch, and that's really it. The sky we're going to do really free and fun, so you don't have to really worry about it too much. We just know we're going to do a couple large brush strokes with some kind of cloud shapes, but nothing too fancy. You'll see how I do that when I paint, and we're going to paint in just a second. So if you can kind of just capture this in your mind, this is kind of the basic idea of it. We're kind of making steps back into the painting to create the illusion of depth. So you have your foreground here, which is a field going across like this. Then you have some pretty close, maybe middle distance here, pine trees, fence posts, some other tree shapes. Then in our kind of further middle distance, we're going to have that prominent mountain right in the center with some bushes and things that kind of lead the eye to the center like this. Like that. And then from there, you have your distant mountains, which are kind of a purple color, which look beautiful, a light, light wash of purple and blue. And then your sky wash. We're going to do a light blue and purplish sky with maybe a little bit of orange in there or uh, lizard and crimson, a little bit of reddish orange. You'll see what we'll do with the washes next. But this is the basic fundamental approach of the glazing technique. We get our sketch in there first, and you can kind of see how I did the sketch. And then from this point, the next step is real easy. We're going to wet the whole paper with water and get in a really light wash over the whole painting. And this is the really easy wash. When you do your first wash with the glazing technique, it's real easy. You're just getting that light wash of bluish purple across the whole paper. And then once that dries, then you come in and we'll do the darker darks here. The mountains, the bushes, the trees, the fence posts, the pine trees over here. And you'll see how it all comes together, okay? All right, so we've actually worked a lot right now. We've done, a, we've covered a lot. Sometimes you might have to rewind and do this one more time, watch it one more time to see how I did all the sketch and everything, or maybe you're fine. Maybe you've seen how I've done this sketch and you don't need any more um, uh, coverage of this. That's fine too. And you can do this in different sizes. You don't have to do this. I'm doing this in, a, I think it's a, 10, a 9 by 14. Let me just make sure here. I can only memorize so many things. So some things I memorize and those are the key things. The other things I don't really worry about. So that's why I kind of have to measure things and I don't memorize everything. I don't have one of those, uh, uh, I don't know, those memories, those people that are on those game shows that can remember everything they've ever heard or saw. Well, I don't have that kind of memory, I'm sorry to say. So this is um, Jeopardy, I meant to say. In the United States, there's a show called Jeopardy, and people on that show usually, they remember everything they've ever heard or read in any kind of newspaper or publication or book or heard about from talking with people. Uh, I'm like the opposite of that. I try to remember only the critical things I need to remember, and the other stuff, I just I just don't have the, the bandwidth to memorize everything. So I remember the key things I need to remember, and that's about it. So this is 12... 14, so this is, you know, apologies, let's, this is what I'm using, Fabriano 9 by 12 paper, student watercolor, that's the cover of the actual paper, so if you ever look up studio watercolor by Fabriano, they make absolutely great paper, and it's student grade paper too, so it doesn't cost a fortune, so if you're kind of like on a budget, and you want to get great paper for a very fair price, you can get a whole pad of this paper, 9 by 12, which is good size. You can cut it in half if you like to work a little smaller. So if you want to make this painting here, we're doing half of this size, which is fine. That's still a pretty good size painting if you trim this in half. And I think there's 50 sheets. So you'd have 100 sheets if you trimmed this in half of this Studio Watercolor by Fabriano gray paper. Okay, so... Um, let's take a break and we'll come right back and we'll start our glazing technique and um, you'll see how fun it is and easy it is. It's not too complicated. So let's cover that in just a second. I'll be right back. All right, we're getting back started again. Hey, I just wanted to let you know, 
I'm going to zoom in on the my brushes that I use for this video. Princeton Real Value Series 9100. So these are the brushes that I use. You'll see me use these all the time on the Extreme Beginners. So I bought that pack there uh, when I was kind of like looking for just a, a good brush. I know Princeton Art and Brush Company makes good brushes because they sell them at my local art store, uh, Blix. Uh, so I have a Blix um, Superstore right nearby my house, uh, right down the road a couple miles. You know, about, f I don't know, five miles from here, not even three, four miles from here. So it takes me 10 minutes to get there with traffic or whatever. But anyway, they have these brushes in there, and I've, that's why, where I picked them up originally. But they sell them online, too, on Amazon. So you can get these on Amazon, and they're just called Princeton Real Value Series 9100. And it's really $14 for, like, six brushes. And these are the brushes I use for all my Extreme Beginners series videos. The only thing is I added a Princeton, the same brand, a Princeton Real Value brush. I added a one inch flat brush like this, which gives me a little bit more coverage with water. So when we're doing the glazing technique, and we're going to use this one right now, this way you have a larger flat brush to get really large washes on your whole paper. But this is the brush set that I use. And it's just called basically a Princeton Real Value Series 9100 with six brushes in it, round brushes, and a couple of uh, flat brushes for the most part. And they work perfect. They're really excellent. They handle beautifully and they're perfect for beginners. And then of course I use my uh, Oval 16 Prang Oval 16 watercolor set for my paints. So this painting I'm improving for the most part. And uh, the Prang Oval 16 set is of course what we use here. They make they make different. They make a square, uh, a square set that has square um, paint wells. So, but if it's, if it's oval, if it's, um, I'm sorry, if it's semi-moist watercolors by Prang, um, this is the old 16 we use, which is great. But if you find there's other sets that are Prang, uh, semi-moist watercolors, that's fine too. It's probably the same colors as this. It might just be a different shape palette. It might be a square palette, but these Prang old 16, and the other Prang semi-moist watercolors are absolutely incredible. You spritz them with water, and in two minutes you're painting. You can close the, you can close it when you're done painting. Come back the next day, open it up, use your spritzer bottle, spritz the paint, and in, and in two minutes it's ready to go, and you can paint again. Beautiful palettes, especially for beginners. You don't want to be wasting time, uh, worrying, you know, trying to squeeze paint into your palettes and. Things are drying and getting moldy and all this kind of stuff. None of that with this. This is a perfect beginner's first, you know, one to three years. You can use this. You'll be happy. It'll work for you perfectly, and it'll you know, it'll save you oodles of time. There won't be any messing around with tubes and paint, tubes and you know stuff like that. Unless you're really getting into it, then you can buy some tube paints, and you'll see me paint with tube paints all the time too on my channel. But let's get going here we're kind of getting bogged down with some details but I know you need to know the information about what paints we're using and what brushes we're using because that's really critical if you're just kind of using your own thing and you're not really f following what we're doing here that's sometimes a problem because you'll get you'll, you're you won't be able to get the same results we're doing so if I can really just be honest with you I'm showing you the best absolute best kind of like gear to get your supplies on my channel so that you use them, please use them, be strict about it. If you can, if you can get the same supplies I'm showing here, you're way better off doing that because I've tested them and I know they really work great for what we're doing in watercolor here, especially. Okay, so um, that's all. But if, you, if for some reason you can't find them where you live, uh, that's okay to make do with what you have. But if you can get your self set up with these, the Prang set with the, um, Princeton Art and Brush Company 9100 series synthetic uh, watercolor brushes, you're really going to have a, a much better time painting because you'll be painting exactly with what we're using and you'll you'll kind of just, you'll see it works great. Okay, so now the f main thing we're going to do right now is we're going to cover this whole paper with water. I'm using, again, a little bit of a larger brush. It doesn't come in that set. This is the, the largest flat brush that comes with that set, which is good size. But for this size painting here, which I still have to zoom back some, 
There we go. And I'll zoom in just a touch there. You need a little bit of a larger brush like this. This is a one inch here. So this might, this is good. This works good with this size paper. So let's get the water on there. Fresh, clean, crystal clear water. I'm going to use my glass here. I'm just going to cover the whole paper with fresh, clean water. And I just cover the whole paper. I cover the whole paper. Because what we'd like to do now is get a nice light wash of purplish blue across the whole seam. Okay, so now I've got the whole paper covered. Everything's covered with a very, very light wash here. Then what I do is I go with a little more water up top here where the sky is. And I actually get that a little more um, wet with uh, water in the sky section. And we might even add a little more yet. Now let's get some paint mixed up. Like we said, we're going to do a purplish blue over the whole paper. So bluish purple. There we go. And it's going to be a light mixture, not too dark and too heavy. Lots of water, just a little bit of paint. Can you see how that is? That's pretty light. Then we rinse off our brush and then we will get a little orange and we'll make a little bit of an orangey red mix here. And that will be for a little bit of a cool, a warmer um, glow in the in the sky. So the cool is going to be the cool of the sky and then a little warm glow of some orange and kind of an orangey red kind of feel to that, which is some of this red here and a little bit of the oranges. And you kind of find that nice warm glow there of some orange and red. Doesn't have to be too um, perfect, just a little bit of orange and red for a little bit of that warm glow. And then that's it. And then we have our purple and blue. And then we might even make a little bit of a darker purple and blue up here. And the reason I'll go a little darker, maybe a touch of brown, just a little bit of brown to kind of give it a little bit of a uh, grayish color to it. Okay, so this is going to be a little darker with a touch of brown for some clouds. This is the lighter blue, and then we have the orangish red, red orangish glow that we're going to add into the painting. Okay, so now we're going to rinse off our brush again and then add a little more fresh, clean water up top. But already we're going to start putting in our color, so let's do that. Let's get our, our light blue, bluish purple, let's call it. You can kind of see how that looks. And then across the bottom of the sheet of paper, let's add some of that reddish orange glow over here. So we're going to add some of that orangish red glow and then maybe some over here too toward the bottom where the horizon line is across the sky where it meets the mountains. And there you have it. Then we make a little bit of a darker cloud up here like so. And then the same thing over here, another kind of darker, a little bit of darker cloud up here like that. And a few over here. Look how gorgeous that is. And you didn't, we didn't have to do much work at all. Perfect. And then you just take the rest of this wash, light blue, and just cover the rest of the paper with that lightish blue wash, even some of the red too. Orangey red, mix that in too. But it's pretty much, you just use up the rest of your um, cool orange, uh, you know, cool, uh, I should say blue and purple, like a bluish purple over the whole paper. And of course you just saw how we did the little bit of that beautiful orangey glow over here in the sky for like right along the mountains. Then you can grab a tissue to lift up any puddles you might see. So if you see any puddles of water, now's the time. 
you might lift up a few puddles of water. If you see any puddles, you shouldn't. You might see some puddles. It all depends on how much water you're putting in to your sky wash. But I think most of you are already catching on with this and you're kind of getting the feel for it already. But if you do find a few puddles here and there, you, go, you can lift them up with a tissue or a paper towel. You can even blot up with a fresh tissue. Let's take, you, take a fresh tissue, no paint on it or anything, just dry fresh tissue. And you can actually put a couple lights in the sky by lifting up some of the paint like this. See how easy that is? You could, you could actually lift out a little bit of paint. Like that. Just for a couple spots to just, you know, lighten it up a little bit, that's all. Very lightly, just tap on the paper a little bit. And that looks good. It gives you a little feeling of uh, some clouds, some clouds here and there, some white fluffy clouds. And you have your blue sky here, your bluer sky and some more bright brightness and then some orangey red in the in the sky too to give it that warm glow, that warm feel of maybe a hazy sunny day. So that's all, but you can see this is a super light wash. You can barely see, but it's on camera. It looks a little lighter. I can see because I'm looking at the viewfinder in my uh, video camera, but I can kind of tell that it's a little darker here in my studio, but it'll lighten up. It'll lighten up quite a bit, but that's the main focus. You want to get that really nice light wash over the whole paper just like we did, and now you're 100% ready to just let it dry. If you want to use a blow dryer, I'm going to use a blow dryer for maybe five minutes. You blow dry this for five minutes and it dries up beautifully. Or if you want to wait for like two, three hours, it'll probably dry in two, three hours, enough that you can go back in and start putting in the rest of your painting. So I hope you'll kind of stick with me on this. With your glazing technique, you always have to remember when you do that first wash like we just did, you either have to do two things. Always remember just two things really you can do. One is you blow dry it for a couple minutes, five minutes, and it becomes dry and then you can start painting again and do the other darker washes on top. Or two, you have to wait at least a couple hours, maybe two hours or a little more, or a little less, depends on uh, how warm you're, where your painting is. If it's cooler or warmer in your place where you live or where you're painting, you might have to wait a little longer or a little less but let's just say a couple hours, it should be good enough. You can go back in and paint. And the way you do is tell is you just touch the paper. And if it's dry to the touch, you can go back in and uh, start painting again. Okay. All right. We're having a fun time here. Of course, we always have fun uh, here. And uh, let's let this dry. And again, I'm going to use the blow dryer. So I'll be actually coming back in just about maybe five or 10 minutes. And I'll we'll begin again and we'll start getting our golden colors and our greens and our bluish greens, our darker darks of our scene here. And you're just going to see how much beauty we can create doing this landscape scene with the glazing technique. So, all right, we'll be right back. All right, so we are back and we are actually, um, I'm just, uh, making sure my camera's in focus. And um, I use the blow dryer, so this is dry right now. It's dry to the touch for the most part. It is still a little bit buckled, so the paper's a tiny bit buckled, which isn't a problem for this painting. Some paintings, you, you might have to let your paper dry so that it it's uh, there's no buckles in it. So that means, you know, you have to let it dry, you know, a little bit longer, or you use the blow dryer a little bit longer to, to dry it off so that you don't have too many buckles in the paper. but. This paper is a little buckled, but it, it's not a problem because we're doing a landscape, so you really don't have too many issues usually when you do a, a painting, a landscape painting, if your paper buckles a little bit and you have a little bit of waviness to it. That shouldn't be a problem. But uh, I'll just kind of go and do my regular routine here. I'm going to just wipe up my palette. I cleaned up my palette, so we have a fresh, clean palette to work with. With this type of painting, you probably, you don't always have to clean your palette if, it, if you have some blues and some you know oranges and reds in there left over that's probably not a problem because we're going to mix some darker colors now anyway but but i just have the habit of always wiping down my palette and making sure i have all my paints cleaned off there and i have a nice fresh start here so then we have our you can see my uh, water in my water 
container here. It's actually a glass. Um, that's fine. It's a little bit of purple in there, but again, we're doing darker darks now. So a little bit of a light purple tint in your water won't hurt if you're making darker darks like greens and things like that and golds here. But you just have to adjust and kind of ask yourself the question all the time. Do I need to change my water? Well, if you're doing a lot of dark darks now, darker colors, darker tonal values in your painting, well, you probably don't have to change your water out. If it's just got a little bit of that purplish tint to it, that probably won't hurt. But if it was really muddy and mucky in here, you probably want to change your water. So that's really the key. If you see your water container is getting really murky looking and a lot of dark looking water in there, that's the perfect time. Dump it out and just pour some fresh, clean water in there and You'll, you'll find your paintings will look a lot uh, better if you, you make sure you keep your water uh, nice and fresh and crystal clear. So let's start out here. We're doing our second glazing. This is dry. You can kind of see it's dry. I can put my hand on this and move it around and there's no smudges or anything like that. It's dry to the touch. And now we're going to mix some colors. Let's mix our greens here and golds. So what I'll do is I'll mix my... Um, predominant colors here, which is going to be yellow and orange. And we're going to make like a yellow ochre, so yellow and orange, and a touch of brown. So we're going to make a yellow ochre color, and again that's just orange, brown, and yellow. And then we have a gorgeous yellow ochre color, like that. Then what we'll do is we'll go in and get some greens. We're going to mix up some greens now. Let's go up here. So we're going to kind of mix. You can kind of notice when I'm mixing my colors, I try to kind of keep them close by to where the wells are. So the paint wells here. So I'm going to go with my greens here, my oranges here, over here in yellow, golden colors here. Then as I'm going further up in my palette, greens are over here. So we have some greens there. Like that. And then I might even go with some blue and purplish color here. Blue, blue, purple, and brown. Maybe even a touch of black. And blue and purple and brown. So I'll get that nice dark and green and purple. I'll get that nice dark green for the uh, pine trees. So there we go, we have some pine tree color there. All right, so we'll rinse off our brush, dry off a little bit of the water there because we're going to use a little bit less water now. So let's get in and start doing some of these gold colors. And this mountain here is going to be that golden color here. So we got to mix up a little more yellow, orange, and brown. And you can just do it as you go. Okay, so you can kind of see I'm using the one inch brush still. And I like to feather it in. So there we have that middle section. Then we might take some of the greens and just make some trees and things here. And we just have to do these quickly though. We don't want to really uh, we'll make some bluer. Let's do some bluer, bluish purple and green down here. What we want, blue, purple, and green. We kind of want to keep the... Um, Blue, purple, and green for these some of these uh, sh trees and bushes in, uh, in the middle distance here. So we just want to put some kind of some ideas of some trees and the, kind of the hill here. So you get some of that cool, interesting shapes of some trees and things like that over here and there. You know, not everywhere. Just you know kind of lightly. Over here we're doing some light bluish 
green, so like bluish green, blue and green together um, actually make things look further in the distance. So if you have a little bit of blue, like this, and the green mixed together, it's going to feel like there's a little bit of uh, mountains in the background here. And uh, distant trees, mountains and distant trees. We're going to do purple mountains in the background already, so or, you know, just in a second. But you can kind of see how we're doing this here. We're kind of working in a nice fashion of just getting some little bits of detail in this uh, kind of hill here, leading up to this little bit of a mountain, a little bit of a mountain top here. But it's in the middle distance, it's not too far, so we still want to have some golds and greens in there, and blues. And uh, I can also dip my brush in the water and get a little bit of some of that blue and do a couple little splashes. And that just gives us a little more feeling of um, variety in our painting. So if you want to add a little couple splashes, please do at this time. Right there, here and there, not everywhere. Just a couple spots here and there. Okay, so now you can kind of see. I dry off my brush on the sponge too as well. And we'll just do some. And then you can always, uh, if you find you want to blot some paint up, you can do that too. See how I can blot up some paint? Got to be careful with blotting, though, too much. But a couple spots you blot up, that's fine. Gives a little more variety. Okay, so now you see how that looks. It looks really good, and it's very... I didn't spend a lot of time on this. Remember, don't spend a lot of time on your middle distance here, because it's just kind of free and flowing, and you don't want to be adding too much detail. That's going to overwork it. You want to keep things under underworked or you want to make sure you're not overworking things and that's what we did here we just make sure we got a little bit of that darker darks over the top of that golden color we put on there that yellowish ochre raw sienna kind of look okay so now let's do the same thing let's mix a little more of that yellow orange and brown for that yellow ochre raw sienna kind of feel put some water in there and then let's get that going over here, over here too as well. As a matter of fact, let's just get that whole bottom section of the painting with that golden color. Just a very super light wash though. Don't, don't add too much water, just a little bit. Can you kind of see how I'm using very little water? Not too much, just enough to coat the paper with a thin layer of water kind of blending all that golden ochre, yellow ochre, and raw sienna kind of feel down into the foreground here. That's perfect. Then what we do is let's get some real, now we're going to go and get some brown, yellow, orange. Let's get some exciting foreground color. Look at that. Wow beautiful, exciting foreground color. That's what you want, right close to the bottom edge of your painting. That's where your most exciting colors are, where you have tons of paint. Look how good that looks. Then we're going to do some greens and brown and green. And then let's get a little bit of a, a dark green here, almost like a little bit of a grass field that's kind of touching up against the Maybe some hay. There's like a hay field here. And now we have some greens mixing in there. And then you have that green, beautiful wash of dark green. Get that dark green bit right across the bottom there like this. And just whoosh right across. <laughs> that looks good, doesn't it? You have to have fun with your watercolors. Don't let it get to you. You're going to try this painting two or three times if you have to, to get it right, or even more. A couple splashes on there, just to give it some texture again. A couple splashes. Just very little though, just a few. Never overdo. And then let's get back in here and continue to remember that watercolor is a fast medium, so we have to work quickly. That's why we have to practice a lot. And uh, let's see, we got the greens. The two greens are light green and dark green. So we're mixing a green wash up here, light green, dark green, with a little bit of water, not too much water. 
and then also some brown in there to make it almost like a olivey green. I think that would look better. Maybe some yellow down here, some yellowish uh, green there right below, and then maybe some even uh, orange like that and red for a couple little spots of exciting color because we're getting closer to us now. The closer you're painting and you're painting, if you're if this is actual, like an actual scene we're standing in or sitting in, we're doing a little bit of painting out here in the plain air. We're having a great time. We're painting in the plain air here. We have our sketchbook and we're sitting in our chair and we're painting, creating a little composition here of this scene. We're going to notice that the colors closest to us in this scene are more rich, chromatic, lots of color, rich colors. And then as they go in the distance, they get lighter and bluer because the distance means cooler, further away, bluer cooler. So your distant colors are cooler, more blues in the, in the distant colors. Closer up you have more rich colors, vibrant colors, warmer colors. Warm and cool, but a little bit warmer and richer colors. More paint. So you're using more paint as you're closer to the foreground. And you're, so the painting, when you're painting your foreground, you're going darker. So that's what we're just basically doing. We're doing a darker wash here. Lots of paint. Okay, so you're going to put on lots of paint here. Have fun with this. Get, get that paint on there. Okay. Mix up a little more paint if you have to. Greens. Dark and light green or we're kind of calling this a sap green and a leaf green. A little bit of brown to make it a little bit of a uh, olivey green. And get some of that olivey color in there in the right to the on the bottom section of this area here. Okay, and then just kind of make it like bushes and things. Make some like that. Then you can just blot up a little bit too. Add a little bit of, blot up a couple spots maybe, just to get a little bit of, a uh, couple of areas of like some, I don't know, a little bit of light splashing around, maybe some sunlight splashing around in there. Okay, then you can even add a little bit of dark brown, brown, blue, and purple. Brown, blue, and purple, and red. A little bit of water, maybe a touch of black. Got to be really careful with the black though, because black is very, very. Uh, with the with these paints here, this black is very strong. So let's make sure if you add in some black, just add a little tiny touch of it. But you can kind of see how it looks really good here. It kind of gives us that feeling of um, we have some. And I'll splash a little bit too, like that. It gives us like a real powerful line across here. So that's where the field ends and all these trees and bushes over here kind of begin. And then you can just maybe do a couple of scratch, you know, scratch up a couple of things here. That's always good to do. A couple of uh, scratches with the thumb or you can use a, uh, any kind of scratching tool, you know, like a anything you might be able to find that might like a small little pen knife or something or whatever you can use. If you have nails, you can scratch in some a little bit of lights in there to make it look like there's a couple of twigs and things like that. Okay, so now we have it really looking beautiful. We have layers of color, darker colors in front, tonal values, darker tonal values in the foreground of our painting. And as it goes further into the distance, we have lighter colors. And eventually we're going to put in these purple mountains too. But we are looking really good. Let's continue working though. I think we can continue. We have been working 15 minutes though. So what I would say now is if you've been working 15 or 20 minutes, it's always a good time to take a break. I'm going to take a break now. We've done quite a bit of uh, painting here. I might add a little bit of dark there. I'll take some of this dark we made and add it right here. Like that, like that, and I think that's good. So 
when we come right back in about five minutes, I'm just going to take a five minute break. We'll finish up the painting. We're actually almost there. We just have to do our distant mountains, which are going to be purple. And we're going to do a couple pine trees and a couple other smaller trees over here in the uh, foreground. All right. So we're almost there, almost hundred percent here. Let's uh, take a quick break and then we'll get started again. And I always mention, if you like this video, please thumbs up. Uh, that really helps my channel. If you're giving me thumbs up, uh, all the time. Uh, I don't mention it enough times, but I know a lot of um, YouTube uh, creators always mention if you thumbs up, it does help a lot. And that means uh, it, it helps me as an artist. I can uh, um, actually uh, become more popular on YouTube. And this way we can uh, reach out to more people and have more fun. More of us all together here painting is more fun, more energy. So let's keep it going. And uh, again, too, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. It's on the right-hand side below. Uh, just if you, by, you know, any chance you haven't subscribed, it's always good if you subscribe this way, you kind of can always find me again and you'll kind of see what I'm doing each week as we go. And you can preview my videos um, as I go each week. And then the ones you want to work on, you're going to actually come by and watch and paint with us and uh, have a good time. Okay. All right. So I'll be right back. Okay, we are back and we're going to get started again. I'm going to get some fresh, clean water. Uh, I think it'll be important in this because we're going to actually do some purple mountains here. We want a really light wash for that purplish blue mountain. So let's uh, change out our water. So I always encourage everybody, please change out your water often when you're painting. You can never go wrong by changing your water. That's for sure. Okay, now the next thing is I'm going to move to a smaller brush. We've been using the one inch uh, Princeton Art, you know, Princeton Art uh, and Brush Company one inch flat brush. Now we're going to shift to a like five eighths, I think it is a five eighths brush. And that comes with that set that I covered in the beginning of the video. So if you want to see the brushes, maybe somehow you've just uh, started the video and maybe you're here at this point now and you, you're saying, oh, Chris, I don't remember. In the first, you know, five minutes of the video, I covered the um, brush sets that I use, or the br one brush set that I use for this painting and for all my extreme beginner videos, as well as the um, paints. I cover what paint set I use, and, you know, right in the beginning of the video, you'll see it within five minutes time, I cover the whole enchilada of details you need for your art supplies, which are your brushes and your paints for the most part and the paper too. I cover what paper I'm using right now, but let's get right started into the um, mountain color. And so right away I say, you know what, let's just clear a small spot on our palette here to make sure we're going to make a nice purplish blue and not have too much problem with um, other colors muddying up our colors. So let's do that. Let's get a blue and a purple. And we'll mix blue and purple together. And that looks good. We'll rinse that off. We get a nice light purplish blue. Now what we do is it's going to dry lighter. So it might look dark right now, but it's going to dry a lot lighter than what we're seeing right here right now. So you'll see how it kind of looks dark right now. The tonal value, I should say, looks kind of dark, but you're going to actually be surprised. Watercolor always dries lighter. So that's all you have to remember is watercolor dries lighter than when you're putting it on. Probably about 40 to 50 percent lighter. So don't worry if it's a little dark, if it looks a little bit, if the tone looks a little bit. And that's all we're doing is putting in that purple mountain there in the background, which really sets the stage for a beautiful three-dimensional painting that looks incredible with quality. I've seen paintings, people, sometimes I see people have artwork in their homes, their offices and whatever, and I see the depth in the paintings and I realize many great artists from history from way back always knew that if you could create a painting that has lots of depth to it, it goes a long way, it makes the painting look so much better. You almost feel like you're seeing into a real scene, an actual something that you're actually going into, like a mountain and a landscape scene and you're seeing mountains and, and uh, hills and trees and if you can get that three-dimensional quality into your painting you're going to really be happy you're going to be very happy with it 
and that's how we're doing it here. We're putting in plenty of three-dimensional quality into this composition. Now, look how much we have completed. Almost everything is 100% complete. All we have left is our pine trees. So let's do our pine trees and a few of these other small uh, fence posts and smaller trees in this foreground here, in the, right in the foreground here in the, this section of the painting. So how do we do it? Let's just, let's get our paints mixed up first. It's much easier if we can mix our paints. Does that make sense, right? It makes so much more sense if we can paint our, um, if we can get our paints mixed in our palette for the most part, mix them up first, get them paint mixed up in there. A little bit of black in there for some dark darks. Rinse off the brush, greens, light and dark green, a little bit of brown, make it a little bit darker, and then some blue and purple for this. Blue and purple. Blue to make a really nice pine tree kind of color. So that looks pretty good. Some more blue, I think. Bluish green. Okay. A little bit of muddiness to it with some brown. Okay, so now we're going to start doing the pine trees. And the only thing with the pine trees is as long as you have your pet, your vertical pencil line on your paper first when you start, where you want your pine trees, then you're pretty much good. Then you're just going to take your brush, load up on with your small flat brush, which is a 5 8 inch flat brush, which again comes with the Princeton Art and Brush Company set, which I show in the beginning of the video. As long as you have this brush, you'll be able to create a gorgeous pine tree by just taking your brush and using it like this. You don't want to paint like this. You want to use it on the edge like this. And then you can kind of just use it this way and you just kind of go with a down stroke like that and then a couple over there like that. Like this. You go in, get a little bit of water. Maybe you might say to yourself, ah, oh, I need a little more orange in there. You can add a little bit of a do a couple scrapes like that blue and purple as long as you see that pencil line you can do that you can do the pencil line just like that pine trees tend to have the branches out like this Do a little bit of finger painting too, that never hurts. A couple of spots though, not everywhere, just a few spots. Like that, there you go, that's one pine tree. And then let's do another one right next to it. This one, you can add a little bit of uh, more gold, yellow and orange, just to change up the color a little bit. Makes it look more interesting if you can change the color up, possibly a little bit. And then you're just doing a couple little flicks out this way. Do a couple like this. Like that. Perfect. You have two pine trees right there completed. And then you kind of fade them down into this section here with a little bit of the orange and yellow. Kind of blend them into the to this area here. You can always blot up a little bit too with a little bit of tissue if you kind of find you might have added too much water. And sometimes I just blot up a little bit like that. There we go. Okay, and then we have a little bit of, okay, perfect, they're right, they're behind these trees and bushes a little bit, so these pine trees are back a little bit over this bit of hedges here, so just to kind of get those, okay, there we go, all right, and one more, let's do one more pine tree, 
We'll do a happy little pine tree here. There we go. This one's a little smaller and we're going to... I rinse off my brush. I have two water buckets. Here's another water bucket over here. We'll make this one a little lighter. And again, the pine trees, the branches kind of go out level like so. And then as they go up higher, they kind of look like that. There we go. That's good. So now we have our three pine trees. Then we'll use our um, Prang Oval 16 brush that we have from our Prang Oval 16 set. And we'll get in some finer brown and orange and yellow. A little bit of blue. And let's do some of these other fine tr trees here and we might need to um, so let's do some of the thicker branches here so you can kind of see I'm doing the thicker branches like that we'll do some of the other uh, fence posts mix up don't make everything the same color try to kind of okay mix up the colors and then here we're gonna do some more fence posts And then there's another tree over here. I just do a little tapping just to kind of soften up some of these bottoms of these fence posts and trees. Like that. And then um, I might use my um, needlepoint brush. Sometimes I, I like to use my needlepoint brush here. This needlepoint brush will actually give me the real fine lines that really um, will kind of make this perfect. So now we have some of this, some of these fine branches. Just a few here and there. Okay, a couple more of these over here so you can get some fine branches there. And there's some fences here. We're going to kind of do some fence posts here. So these are some wires, but they're not everywhere. The wires are kind of broken and some are there. And then uh, what else do we have? And then if I need a little darker darks here, I mix up a little bit of darker darks there. And you can get a lot of versatility with your needlepoint brush. And then I use a little bit of, I use a little bit of the, the tissue and I leaned into my painting and made a couple of spots that were, and then you can just scrub those areas with a little bit of tissue or paper towel if you leaned into your painting a little bit, and then you just add a little paint over top, and then there's no problem with it. You can even add a little more grasses and things in the foreground here. You can do that. Not everywhere, just maybe a few here and there. Just a few here and there, just to kind of, a couple of wisps of grass and weeds goes a long way, just a few, and a little more, a couple more splashes. I just put a couple more splashes in the foreground here just to give it some texture over here too. Okay, and I think that looks perfect. All right, so let's call this a day. I'm glad you're painting along with me. We had such a fun time here doing this landscape painting. Glazing technique. This is an extreme beginner series painting, which means you're actually going to do fine. You're just going to stick with the program, the methods, the techniques that we use on a constant basis here, and you will definitely get the hang of it. 
as long as you're stopping by week after week, month after month, and year after year, you'll be painting beautiful and successful watercolors. Okay, so I promise you that. And um, please leave comments in the comments section. This way, if anyone else that's painting along, that's been working with me for quite a long time, they'll answer your questions if I don't get to them um, about techniques or any kind of issues you might have. So always remember, the comment section is the place where you can ask questions. If you're getting stuck on something or you don't understand something, I can answer the questions. Or there's many other people here that are on my channel that have been painting a long time and they're actually fantastic watercolor artists. They can also um, answer your comments as well if I can't get to them again. But... I try to answer all my comments and read all your comments, and I'm really thankful that you do send me a lot of comments, and most times they're just really very kind comments. So thank you so much again for always encouraging me, and it keeps me uh, going for the gusto every week and uh, every month and year after year here on YouTube. So until we meet up again, thank you so much, and uh, happy painting, everybody.